Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Celebration of Spirit here at the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living, where we honor each and every one of you wherever you are on your spiritual path. Uh, please take this opportunity to turn off any cell phones or electronic gizmos that you may have that might interrupt the sacred space that we will be creating here today. Then say hi to somebody, especially if you haven't seen them for a while. <laughs> As I said before, we honor each and every one of you here at the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living where we know that there are infinite paths too, but indeed only one God. Yes. And the words of the morning chant will be up here on the screen, followed by a spiritual mind treatment by Leslie Gianetti. Thank you. Actually, there are two morning chants. So we'll, um, the first one is one you can stand up for. There's a good for me, and I ought to have it. So let's just claim it. going to sit down for the next chant, which is a chant for universal compassion, a time to uh, breathe that compassion into our lives, uh, let it flow through us, and in the process, transform ourselves and the world, creating the world as a three-dimensional mandala of universal compassion. The words to the chant, Om Tare Tare Tut Tare Ture Soha. And now to let all the unseen ones in the vicinity know we're about to do something important.
tare, tu tare, tu re so ha, om tare, tare, tu tare, tu re so ha, om tare, tare, tu tare, tu re so ha, om. Just leaning into this beautiful, sacred space, this one infinite life, this one magnificent, absolute, all in all, divine presence, which moves upon itself and it creates out of itself everything. The one infinite life is in each one and each one is in the one infinite life. This is the most exquisite realization of truth of being, that it is the power that breathes my breath and beats my heart. And as this is true for me, this is the absolute truth for each one here. The breath, the mind, the heart, the body temple, overflowing with the power and the presence of the one. The vibration of divine love moving upon itself and creating through each one. At the heart of creation is the peaceful knowing of divine order and divine perfection. And no one can be lost in this precious life. So I speak my word for each one here. And I claim a shift in consciousness to release any burden of the heart in this moment. Just let it go. And I further claim for each one the deep, resonant realization of the one power and the one presence which created each one from itself. It takes the form of its creation. It inspires, it enlightens, it motivates, and it loves. I accept for each one the deep realization that no one can ever fall outside of the life principle that it is always in full operation for the highest possible good for all and the harm of none. It is always creating every moment by moment with beauty and abundance and wisdom. It gives of itself completely. And I accept for each one the greatest receptivity to the life within. And I celebrate this life within each one and all creation and I release my word now to the law of mind. 
which operates on my word as a new creation ready to be made manifest right now in this moment and forever. And so it is. We uh, had a different solo planned for you today to go with the different talk, but we've, we've switched gears at the last minute, and we hope that this one fits your talk beautifully. Um, there is a little potential sing-along chorus with it, and it goes, Om Shanti 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 Om. So if you, when you hear that part, if you'd like to join in, that's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, no. 
Anton Miserak and Laura Berryhill. Thank you very much. Delightful to have you with us this morning. That was lovely. Yes. Well, good morning. I'll tell you more about why I'm standing here in just a minute. But first, for those of you who are here with us for the very first time this morning, our welcoming and membership team members are up here, and they have packets uh, with goodies for you in them. There's no obligation, there's no pressure whatsoever, but in those packets, you're gonna find a little blue card. And if you fill out the blue card, and you take it back to their table and give it to them, they're gonna give you a present, which is this little blue book called What Religious Science Teaches, which is all about what we believe and yada yada. So you can learn more about us and also have somebody specifically welcome you and greet you. So all they wanna do right now is hand that to you. So if you're willing to receive a gift and you're here for the very first time or you're back for the first time after a while, give a wave. Yes, we have a couple here and one back here and just keep your hand up for a second so they can find you. You don't have to say a thing and uh, and that is absolutely wonderful. We're thrilled that you're here. And let's welcome them by giving them a hand. Thank you so much. So um, we have been talking about the theme for the year in Centers for Spiritual Living, which is 100 Years of Science of Mind, because it was 100 years ago that our founder, Ernest Holmes, published his first book, Creative Thought. And so this way of thinking and teaching and being is a coming together of the laws of science, the revelations of religion, the opinions of philosophy. Ernest Holmes was widely read and he pulled all that together into a philosophy of life that evolved into these teaching and learning spiritual centers that we have today. Each month of this year, our centers have been following themes. So we have a new one today, uh, now that we're in June, and it is spiritual wisdom and how to follow it. So, um, you may have noticed that I'm not actually Reverend Carol. I am Reverend Mary Murray Shelton. Hi, all of you out there in streaming land, surprise. Um, Reverend Carol will be here next week and she will be doing the talk that she had planned for today. So if you came specifically to hear that, come back next week and you will. Uh, so let me say, first of all, everything's fine. But last night, it didn't look that way. Uh, Carol took Paul, her husband of one month, to emergency with uh, some severe abdominal pains. And um, they did uh, arthroscopic surgery last night and determined that it was adhesions from a previous surgery that had squeezed off a part of the small intestine. And it was not, um, it seems to be working fine but they're gonna keep him in the hospital for a couple days just to make sure everything's okay and there's no infection. So, uh, but Carol got home about 3.45 this morning and um, she's probably back at the hospital by now. And so that's why I'm here. So surprise, <laughs> this, is, this is the story. This is the story. And so rather than have a bunch of slides for the talk, I saved hers out for next week and I'm just gonna give you this one. Landing in the lost and found. Um, landing in the lost and found does have something to do with spiritual guidance and wisdom and how to follow it. Uh, but let me tell you this little story first about lost and found. These two little boys rushed home, two little brothers rushed home carrying a brand new football. Where did you get that? Their mother asked them. We found it, the oldest boy told her. Really, she says, are you absolutely sure that football had been lost? Oh yes, mama, said the younger boy. We even saw the people who were looking for it. <laughs> so our definitions of lost and found, um, they can be a little squirrely sometimes. And sometimes we're the ones who are lost. 
individually or collectively. Now, usually, the lost and found is a place for objects that have been mistakenly left behind. And I can, I can think of some that I never did find that I still miss. You probably can, too. So if it's a thing, then we have to let it, let it go. Um, but occasionally, it may be us that's gotten lost. How many of you saw the movie Lion? I, I saw it a while back now, maybe six months ago or so. And it's the story of a very little boy in India who, due to a series of circumstances, winds up on a train by himself that takes him very far away from his home. And he only knows his first name. He doesn't, and he kind of knows the name of the village he came from, but no one actually understands. And he's also speaking a different dialect. So he winds up going through a series of circumstances and growing up and creating an identity for himself. And there's a point in the story where he's having a conversation with his girlfriend after he's kind of told his story to somebody, an abbreviated version of it, and he says to her, you know, that's not really true. He says, I'm lost. And at that moment, it's so touching that he does not know who he is or where he came from. Um, and I won't say any more about it now in case you haven't seen it, but this is an experience that we sometimes have of being aware that something isn't right, that we feel disconnected and out of place, not quite right with ourselves maybe, not quite right with the world. We want that feeling of being home, the feeling of being safe, the feeling of being right where we belong. And there are lots of ways of getting lost. Some of them happen to us early in our lives because of trauma. Some of us happen, some, some of us get lost because there are choices we make in our lives that disconnect us from the truth of who we are. So if we're out of integrity with ourselves somehow, we can feel lost, like something isn't quite right, and we're trying to get it right, but we may not realize that what needs to happen isn't out there. It's actually a reintegration, a coming back into integrity. Um, I heard at one point that integrity actually was a, a term that had to do with um, um, metals, that a metal that was in integrity was not diluted at all. It was pure. So years ago, when I had the Global Heart Center for Spiritual Living up in Santa Rosa, uh, integrity was one of our core values. And the way we defined it was, integrity is living honorably in word and deed from the deepest level of one's being. So it's a pretty tall order to be in integrity all the time. There are lots of things that happen in life that pull us one way or another, and we're constantly making that kind of choice. Rumi talked about the opportunity to have infinite opportunities to come back in the song about the caravan. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you've broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. Come, come. So we never have run out of opportunities to get back into the place of being found, to get back into that sense of home. As long as we're breathing, and maybe even after we're done breathing, we continue to have those opportunities to find ourselves or to get found. Ernest Holmes, our founder, wrote, no matter what our emotional storm or what our objective situation may be, there is always something hidden in the inner being that has never been violated. We may stumble, but always is that eternal voice forever whispering within our ear, that thing which causes the eternal quest, that thing which forever sings and sings. It's the same message said in a different way, that what we are seeking, we, it's, it's a, a, to use a very inappropriate example, a justice once said that 
he knew what was lewd or pornographic when he saw it. And that was how he identified it for, you know, this is over the top, it's too much. But I think in our own lives that we know when we see bits of the right path, there's something in us that responds to that. And if we haven't made a practice of always ignoring that, it becomes easier and easier to see it and to move toward it. But always we can make that choice. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter what we've experienced before, no matter how long we've been lost, or how, um, how difficult the task seems to be to get found. Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, uh, said, life is never made unbearable by circumstances. Now, I would probably argue with that, except it's hard to argue with somebody who's a Holocaust survivor. Uh, over something like that. Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. So we can have everything in the world we could possibly want in our lives and still feel empty if it feels like we and our lives are devoid of meaning and purpose. Does this make sense? Yeah? Can you relate to that? And so... When we want to be found again, the first thing we have to do is recognize that we're lost. And often the question comes up, how did I get here? How did this happen? You know, uh, did I abandon my values for some short-term good? Or was I mistaken in compromising myself for some reason? Did I feel like my circumstances made it impossible to make another choice? Like I would want to say to people defensively maybe, well, if you had been in my situation, you would have done the same thing. Trust me, you would have, you would have made the same choice. But it becomes, it might be a reason, but it can't be an excuse for what we did. So if... If we find ourselves in a situation where we have lost our connection, then it isn't so much a question of how that happened or why that happened as to recognize that if we're there in that circumstance, we're participating somehow. If we're here in the world today, we're participating in the circumstances of the world today. Otherwise, we'd be somewhere else. We're here because there's something that is a gift to us in it. And we're also here because there is some gift we're called to give to it. Both of those things. Otherwise, we'd be somewhere else. But we need this, and it needs us. So there's a, a synergy going on, even in the midst of this feeling of being lost sometimes. Now, we don't only get lost individually. We also co-create being lost sometimes. A whole group can go off track in terms of whatever beliefs we get into, whatever fears we hold. And it's much easier to see when someone else or some other group is doing that because they're doing something different than what we think they should be doing. So we decide they're off track. They might be, or it could be us. But the question then becomes, how do we individually and collectively then come home. So coming home, using that spiritual wisdom that's always in us, does have something to do with welcoming, and it also has something to do with releasing or letting go. When we are living out of integrity, when we're disconnected from the truth of our own being, our own source, we're like a parched plant that needs water, and maybe we're even like uh, a little, you know, for those of you mothers who ever nursed, guys, this might be too much information. If it is, I'm really sorry. Uh, there's a thing that happens when you're nursing a baby where the milk lets down. You can feel it let down, and then it, is, it flows for the baby, and it's stimulated by the baby's nursing to let down, but sometimes it takes longer than other times. So you have a very hungry little person, who's crying, who wants to eat, you want them to eat, and it's not quite happening yet, and they're working really hard, and they're getting very frustrated. And sometimes that frustration causes them to pull away and just scream in anger. Now, it's even more frustrating for both of you, because what they need is right there, and they're, they're lost, because they can't find it yet, or they can't wait for it, even though it's 
coming to be given to them. Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Not as a nursing mother or as a nursing baby, but just in general, yeah? So we sometimes just have a hard time keeping the faith to wait that little bit longer for what is trying to come to us, but everything needs to fall into place for that to happen. When we are found, in a sense, there's a sense of relief, a sense of coming back to where we needed to be or being home, coming back, and we are realigned with our true nature. And it can be scary to come back to that, but we have to cross a boundary or a threshold to do it. It's a point of decision where rather than stay with what we've become familiar with or comfortable with, we make a choice to take a risk and step over a threshold because of a larger possibility for what we want and what we truly are. And that inner voice whispering in our ear that's bringing us forward to where we need to go. This story um, comes from Roger, uh, Robert Fulgham's book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. In the early, dry, dark of an October Saturday evening, the neighborhood children are playing hide-and-seek. How long since I played hide-and-seek? 30 years, maybe more. I remember how. I could become part of the game in a moment, if invited. Adults don't play hide-and-seek. Not for fun, anyway. Too bad. Did you ever have a kid in your neighborhood who always hid so good nobody could find him? We did. After a while, we'd give up on him and go off leaving him to rot wherever he was. Sooner or later, he'd show up all mad because we didn't keep looking for him, and we would get mad back because he wasn't playing the game the way it was supposed to be played. There's hiding and there's finding, we'd say. And he'd say it was hide and seek, not hide and give up. And we'd all yell about who made the rules and who cared anyway and how we wouldn't play with him anymore if he didn't get it straight and who needed him anyhow and things like that. Hide and seek and yell. No matter what though, the next time he would hide too good again. He's probably still hidden somewhere for all I know. As I write this, the neighborhood game goes on, and there is a kid under a pile of leaves in the yard just under my window. He's been there a long time now, and everybody else is found, and they're about to give up on him over at the base. I consider going out to the base and telling them where he's hiding, and I thought about setting the leaves on fire to drive him out. <laughs> Finally, I just yelled, get found, kid! out the window and scared him so bad he probably wet his pants and started crying and ran home to tell his mother. It's real hard to know how to be helpful sometimes. A man I know last year found out he had terminal cancer. He was a doctor and he knew about dying and he didn't want to make his family and friends suffer through that with him. So he kept his secret and died. Everybody said how brave he was to bear his suffering in silence and not tell everybody and so on. But privately, his family and friends said how angry they were that he didn't need them, didn't trust their strength, and it hurt that he didn't say goodbye. He hid too well. Getting found would have kept him in the game. Hide and seek grown up style, wanting to hide needing to be sought, confused about being found. I don't want anyone to know. What will people think? I don't want to bother anyone. Better than hide and seek, I like the game called Sardines. In Sardines, the, purple who, the person who's it goes and hides, and everybody goes looking for him. And when you find him, you get in with him and hide there with him. And pretty soon, everybody is hiding together, all stacked in a small space, like puppies in a pile. And pretty soon, somebody giggles and somebody laughs and everybody gets found. Medieval theologians even described God in hide-and-seek terms, calling him Deus Abscondicus. But me, I think old God is a sardine player and will be found the same way everybody gets found in sardines, by the sound of laughter of those heaped together at the end. 
All y'all are oxen free. The kids out in the street are hollering the cry that says, come on in wherever you are, it's a new game. And so I say to all those who have hid too good, get found, kid. Ali Ali Oxen Free. Thanks. One of the things about getting lost is that when we want to get found, we actually have to make a decision. We have to surrender to the embarrassment of the situation, and we have to be willing to receive resources and help and support to find our way back, to request help, even. The inner work is making the reconnections with ourselves, and the outer work is practice of welcoming, without judging, welcoming the gifts that come to us and letting go of that which we have to grow out of now in order to go home, in order to be found. Alan Cohen said, you will find truth more quickly through delight than gravity. Let out a little more string on your kite. Let out a little more string on your kite. Invite joy, invite beauty, invite friendship. When you do this, you are changed in a fundamental way, maybe even alchemically. You discover that you have a new power that regrounds you in the truth of who you are, but you also have a new responsibility. When you're truly changed, you come to the world differently, which does mean that certain things reveal themselves to you, certain guidance and wisdom, and those things become yours, which may mean that you also have to let go of sometimes friends sometimes places and habits, sometimes certain kinds of nostalgia or memories, sometimes even family members, we have to be willing to change and let the change that we are have its impact in the world. People in recovery experience this all the time, that when they change, that which they thought could never change begins to change around them and in them. Does this make sense? Do you, do you recognize what I'm saying here? So when we come into that place, it may mean making amends. It may mean becoming visible when we haven't wanted to or we haven't done it before. It means putting the sourcing that we already have to use and being open to receive the additional sourcing that comes to us and allowing our own being lost to be the one of the essential factors that actually leads to us being found. You know, if you are in the darkness, in a darkened room, and there are no windows or doors that you can see through, but there's light outside, you might see a little strip of light under the door. And you know, if you're in complete darkness, that's where your attention will go to that little strip of light under the door. But that little strip of light is not something that draws your attention when you have the lights on in the room. You don't even notice it. You don't even know there's light out there. It's being in the dark that shows you where the light really is besides what might be right around you. So when we're lost is when getting found is the most likely to reveal itself to us in the way to go. So if we're sitting in the room in the light, it seems like everything's fine, but we're confused about where to go next. It isn't until we find ourselves completely in the dark sometimes that we get a clue, that we really get the clue. And for me, this is like the story of caterpillars and butterflies. And I know you know I've talked about this before, and I want to say a little bit more about it today. Um, because the butterfly is a completely different genome than a caterpillar. It's like they're two completely different creatures that somehow symbiotically require one another in order for one to come forth from the other. And so what happens with the caterpillar, who doesn't know this is coming, is that the caterpillar goes into this ravenous hunger where it just eats leaves until it's fit to burst. It's so 
uh, stuffed and packed. And then it goes and it hangs on the branch upside down in a kind of a J shape. And as it does that, something starts to happen inside of it. It's like that's the trigger for these cells that don't belong to the caterpillar to start to multiply inside it. They're called imaginal cells. That's actually what they're called. And the caterpillar's immune system knows that those are foreigners, and so it attacks them. But they become stronger and stronger, and they multiply and multiply until the caterpillar's immune system is completely overcome. And its internal organs in this struggle become like soup or jello. And the imaginal cells that are multiplying feed on this soup. Meanwhile, the exterior of the caterpillar, its own skin of its body, becomes hard and becomes the chrysalis inside which this transformation is taking place. It doesn't spin a cocoon like moths do. It's a completely different thing. And so it's eating this up, and when the butterfly is ready to hatch, when it's fully formed, the chrysalis becomes transparent. And then the need for its restriction has been outgrown and the struggle to escape from this chrysalis begins. And it is connected to breath. So they say that when a chrysalis breaks open, you can actually hear a pop. And it comes because the butterfly takes a very deep breath and it pops open. So inspiration, inspire, in spirit, takes a breath, and its freedom begins to manifest. And as the butterfly emerges, it's upside down, but it immediately turns right side up and it holds the chrysalis in its front feelers, legs, feet, I don't know what you call them, like a thank you, like a prayer of gratitude to the chrysalis, to the prison that it was in. And then the inner pump in the butterfly has to go to work because its body still contains a lot of fluid and the wings are kind of wet and droopy. So as this pump in its body begins, it pumps all this liquid out into the wings so the butterfly can spread its wings and fly. If it doesn't do that, if we help it out of the chrysalis too soon, it's not ready for that, it dies. So we have to let it struggle. We have to let it struggle to escape. And in that struggle, it gains the strength to fly. So I think that this is like us, that the actual struggle that we go through in being lost is the very thing that empowers us to be found, that leads us to know what we need to do and where we need to go and what to say in the moment that that something just bursts out of our mouths. And we recognize that that was a moment of wisdom that came forth from us. You may have the experience of talking to a friend who's upset and hearing wisdom come out of your mouth and thinking, where'd that come from? You know, that, wow, that wasn't me. I don't know where that came from. Has anybody had that experience? That wisdom, that guidance, that depth, it lives in us all the time, but it only comes forth when it's called and when we allow it. It has to be both things. So we can put off responding to a call for a long time. We're different than a butterfly or a caterpillar. You know, with a caterpillar, once this thing starts, there's no going back. The caterpillar thinks it's dying, but if it doesn't surrender, it's just jello. There's nothing else going on. It has to go forward. None of them stay in the cocoon, in the, in the chrysalis, forever. Like, likewise, similarly, there are no butterflies who refuse to come out either. They break, as long as they're healthy, they're gonna break out of there and fly. So if there is a place in your life right now where you feel lost or caught, where you want to be found or you wish you could be found or you've been thinking it's not possible, 
I encourage you, or as, as my Irish Catholic priest used to say when I was a little kid at Mass, I exhort you, my dear people, I exhort you to, to change that thought that it can't happen or it's too late for you to be found. It is not too late. And likewise, if you know someone who's lost, then keep it in the back of your mind that it is still possible for them to be found and that everything they need is available when they're ready for it. Will you do that with me? And that's the way that we're gonna begin this month to put spiritual wisdom and guidance into practice. That's how we're gonna do it. Now I wanna draw your attention for this moment. Hello, where's my little note here? To this beautiful altar over here that was created by Suzanne Dubois. By the way, um, unlike how this often happens, these peppers are not to take because she's going someplace afterwards where she needs them. So don't take the peppers, but what you'll see here is there is a dolphin, a brass dolphin, and then a little tiny one with it, who are to me representations of freedom and foundness. You have the candles which are showing the light that we need to find our way. The beautiful tiger lilies which bloom for a day and show their beauty and are not envious of those that have more time. They, they don't hold anything back. It's fully given. And here, because Reverend Carroll's message was about giving and receiving that love and graciousness, which you'll hear about next week. We have this beautiful mirror that's hidden behind these doors. So this is what it's like for us when we're lost. The doors are closed. But there's still that reflection of the whole inside of us. Getting found is just a matter of opening the doors. And remember, the handle to the door is always on the inside. Namaste. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, inner work. <laughs> really quickly, close your eyes. And if you can, put your hand on your heart and feel your heartbeat. This is home, you're carrying it with you. Whenever you feel like you're lost, take a deep breath and put your hands over your heart and remember, right where I am, God is. And so it is. Thank you practitioners for leaping up for that two seconds. You did great. And now, Anton Miserak and Laura Berryhill.
Is it on? Uh, I've always liked to play Lost and Found. In fact, one of my favorite games is, uh, as a lot of you know, I like to travel alone. And every time I'm in Venice, I want to see how lost I can get. <laughs> and it's quite, I found some great experiences, beautiful things to draw, wonderful people. And only that I know I'm not afraid of alone because of all the philosophy I've learned here. So will the ushers come forward so we can continue this wonderful service. And thank you for the music. It was so wonderful. And your spur of the moment talk <laughs> brought spur of the moment thoughts here, too. So will the ushers please go forward and keep us running here so we can be found and have a great foundation. This gift I give is God in action. I now send it forth to bless and to prosper. I know that everywhere it goes, it is creating a world living in love, one heart, one thought at a time. And so it is. Thank you, Jet. Okay. So I also want to say that uh, Reverend Carol is welcoming a prayer. If you would like to include her and Paul in prayer, she'd love that. Practitioners, I'll just give you that heads up. And um, once again, I want to thank Suzanne Dubois for the wonderful altar this morning. And uh, yes, it's gorgeous. Thank you, Suzanne. I want to thank Anton Miserak and Lauren Berryhill for standing in for Bodhi this morning and as he's up and about and doing such a wonderful job. And let's see, I want to thank Jet for prosperity, Leslie for practitioner doing our, our morning prayer, Rick as the welcome guy who stood in for me over there at the uh, uh, computer just in case I couldn't get the clicker to work this morning, Ron and Tom who are overdoing the streaming and the filming for the video this morning, those who are manning the tables, both the membership table and the partnership table because today is partnership Sunday. Now, Reverend Barbara is not here today because she hurt her back, uh, but she will be here next month. But she wanted to let you know that the kids in Ukraine that do their annual um, uh, essay contest uh, did one this year on what peace means to me. And it finished yesterday, I guess, and they were some very inspiring, wonderful things. And she's interested in seeing if um, this community wants to do some kind of a joint um, project of some sort, peace project or something, with the Ukrainian group. So if you have ideas for that, jot them down, save them, keep a, keep a hold of them so that you can give them to her when she comes in July. Or if you have her info, you can just send it to her. That would be great. Um, I also want to say before I move on here that um, you will notice, I think there are no snacks over there. Um, 
sorry? There aren't, they're not out yet. And what that reminds me of is the fact that the snack team, they need your help or there really will be an empty table over there on some Sundays. And so in your program this morning, in your bulletin, there's a little blurb about uh, snacks and who to talk to if you're willing to help on occasion and how to do that. It's not hard. You just bring something yummy and we all, you know, rant and rave about it. It's great. Okay. Uh, I want to bring up Pat Sandry, who is the Leadership Council President for a special announcement. Come on. Okay. So they can see you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we all know that spirit is very inventive and full of surprises. Look at Reverend Carol. She's found the love of her life, and she's heading off to England um, to live there. At the annual meeting, we announced that Reverend Mary would be our interim minister. That meant she would not and could not candidate for the position of senior minister at GGCSL. At that time, Reverend Mary had told us that she was not interested in being the senior minister, so was happy with that arrangement. But Spirit had other surprises in <laughs> store. <laughs> Soon, Reverend Mary began to hear from so many of you about how much you wished that she would be our new senior minister. <laughs> Soon, members of the Leadership Council began reporting to each other how many people were coming to us saying, what about Reverend Mary? You asked Mary, and she listened. You asked the Leadership Council, and we listened. We are happy to report that Reverend Mary recently let the Council know that she is now interested in being the Senior Minister at GGCSL. <laughs> <laughs> At our meeting with Reverend Mar Mary, Francine Huss presented an amazing visioning type process she developed to allow us to more fully align ourselves with spirit and principle. We created an outline of the most important qualities going forward for GGCSL and the new senior minister with the emphasis on being what we wanted and what we wanted to say yes to. As a result of that meeting with Reverend Mary, the Leadership Council is now in 100% agreement that Reverend Mary has the credentials and ability to fill the position of senior minister at GGCSL. The final decision, of course, is up to you. There are options on how to move forward, all of which require your attention and your approval as members of the Golden Gate Center. Very briefly, the first option is to go forward with the candidating process as we had planned, but with another interim minister. The second option is a process of direct select and is used when a candidate is well known to a community and there is a direct vote for the candidate. An email will be sent out tomorrow to all members of record outlining the options we now have available for going forward and explaining the benefits of each. There will be a town hall meeting on June 24th where you will all have an opportunity for conversation and questions with Reverend Mary prior to the voting. We are aware that some of you will be traveling and not able to attend the meeting. We want all of you to participate in this very important decision, so there'll be an absentee ballot, ballot available. A link to this ballot will be in the email. Watch for an email, this is important, with the subject line, GGCSL 
voting information absentee ballot. That will have all the information you ever wanted to know in that email. That email, we have three, two more Sundays and two more Mondays. So there'll be two more announcements from the pulpit and there'll be um, three emails going out prior to the, uh, the, annual, the town hall meeting. After our service, Lori Greer and I will be up here and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We're just full of surprises this morning. Um, so we are still looking for, uh, I think, some more income for our video system. We need a camera and a computer. And um, you can make a donation for that. I believe over here on this table there's a box that you can make a donation for it. It would be a special donation above and beyond what you usually do. But please put in the memo line that it's for the video system for streaming and archiving our Sunday services so that people can watch them. And if you have questions about that, talk to these guys because they know all about it. All right? If you are a Gemini, like me, my birthday's tomorrow. If you are a Gemini, yeah, I'm going to be 112. Um, the, if you are a Gemini and you're a member of this community, you get a free birthday checkup with one of our prayer practitioners. So these people who are wearing the stoles this morning and any of the, anybody else out here with a stole on, these are our licensed professional practitioners. They're there specifically to know the truth for you in consciousness and to pray with you and for you about that truth. Sometimes it's harder to see our truth when we're lost. They can help know that the path forward is clear and we're on it. So if you are a Gemini and you'd like a free birthday checkup, go and pick up your form at the table. They'll help you find it. And, uh, and you can get a free full session with a practitioner of your choice. They're listed, I think, on the back of your program. And if you are here this morning and you'd like a mini prayer, just go over to the practitioner table after the service and they'll get with you and do that right then as our gift to you. Uh, on June 10th, which is next Sunday, Leslie Janetti is bringing back for the third time now, by popular demand, the Power of Spiritual Mind Treatment Workshop, which will help you understand this prayer process that we use and to go into it more deeply so you can also use it for yourself. On the same day that we're having our town hall meeting, our men are doing a Mediterranean brunch. Breakfast? Brunch? Lunch? A meal. It's happening after the service, a Mediterranean meal. It's only $10, so you don't need to come to the meeting hungry. So avail yourself of that because it'll be lovely. Also, Reverend Carol has two workshops left. I heard the spoon bending workshop was fabulous. Um, she has two more workshops left that are both happening in July. You can sign up for them today, I think at the education table. One is conscious endings, and the other one is how to download a talk from spirit, so you don't want to miss that. And finally, Woman Spirit Rising is coming back this year. It's going to be from September 12th to the 16th at the Rivers Bend Retreat Center. You can register for it online. If you have any questions about that, please talk to Lori Greer, who's right here. You stand up and give a wave, Lori, so they know who you are. Talk to Lori Greer, and she will answer all your questions. She's our magic uh, Woman Spirit Rising lady for us this morning. All right, that is it for the announcements. So please stand and join me for the affirmation. As we step into this blessing time and you take hands with each other, please know that every hand you hold is the presence of spirit in disguise next to you. And that the hands you are holding those hands with are also the presence of spirit disguised as you. This blessing is available to us at every moment, and we accept it with enthusiasm and welcome right now. And so it is. And here is the affirmation for today. This is Reverend Carol's affirmation, so we may use it next week again. Join me now. I always act from my highest place, honoring and respecting all others and myself. 
I thereby promote peace, joy, love, creativity, and all divine qualities, assuring a good life for all beings. Remain standing and join us for the peace song. Wonderful week.